The lines between video game genres have become increasingly more blurred over the last 10 years. Nowadays, when someone asks, what's your favorite video game genre, you may find it hard to answer. The boundaries between genres have also become more opaque, and many genres of the past have been twisted into new forms, new cross-genres, or have become something else entirely. When you played an RPG between 1995 and 1999, you generally were playing one of two different games. You were either playing a top-down character RPG, such as Diablo, Boulder's Gate, Neverwinter Nights, just a few examples in a giant pool in this market. In another realm, you could have been playing a game like Final Fantasy VII, for instance, which was released in 1997, or Chrono Cross, released two years later. These Japanese-style role-playing games that we dubbed JRPGs were in the apex of their popularity during this time, with Final Fantasy VII riding the giant tidal wave of success of the prior six titles enjoyed by many fans throughout the decade that preceded. Both types of RPGs were marked by a rich story, combat of some description, story-driven character development, and in-game character progression. We talked to NPCs, we engaged in battles, we upgraded our characters, we made choices, and we relished in the stories that developers crafted for us. And sometimes we crafted our own stories and the decisions we could make in games like Boulder's Gate could dictate the storytelling process or influence game outcomes. Sometimes we made our own stories. This happened directly through the choices that we made throughout the game, the skill points we allocated, the abilities we sought out, but also indirectly through the lives we led inside the game and the stories we told of them outside of the game to our friends and fellow gamers. We sometimes shut off the console and took time to think on how far our characters have come and what was to come in the next few hours of gameplay. Regardless of whether they were character-focused action RPGs or upheld with Japanese-style storytelling tropes, we were playing an RPG because we lived the lives of the characters in those stories. What is an RPG today? Many people consider Dark Souls to be an RPG. It has leveling, character progression in the game, a story, and dialogue. It sounds like an RPG, right? Arguments for yes, this is an RPG, or no, it's not, are both valid and a reflection of the current state of gaming. It's like a box of Lucky Charms. There's a lot of different kinds of marshmallows in a box, but once you get them in your bowl and you start shoving them in your mouth, they taste about the same. In an effort to be as objective as possible and not cross any boundaries, we will take a normal amount of liberties in segmenting off and defining video game genres. Simply speaking, I will be using the same criteria as some of the market research companies who study gaming data. A report by market research company Tessa defines video game genres as follows. On your screen right now is the eight genres that do a pretty good job of summing up the gaming industry and genres. So let's go down the list really quick. Sports games are pretty obvious. They're sports games. Action games. Think Bayonetta, Devil May Cry. Adventure games. Think platformers, Mario, Banjo-Kazooie, etc. Shooters, think first-person shooters, but not limited to first-person. Role-playing games, which we've covered above. Strategy games, think top-down strategies, tactics games, or 4X. And then we have racing and fighting. Can you guess which three genres are the least popular? I'll give you a minute to think it over. Now, let's go by sales and popularity through each one briefly. By far the most niche market for games has got to be racing. You either love racing games, hate them, or really just haven't played a good one and therefore don't really have an opinion. Honestly, I'm part of the latter group, although I've always had a really interesting history with racing games. For me, racing games are always really exciting to watch. It's a great spectators genre that unfortunately has very high barriers to entry for new players due to the high skill requirement in order to be proficient with these games. If gamers are scared to go into a new genre because it's difficult to succeed in it, then it's hard to sell copies. 
If we take a look at Gran Turismo 6, touted as the most hyped racing game of all time in 2013, it sold just 1 million units in America and 4 million globally. A fair number, but nothing to sweat at when looking at other popular games, such as Minecraft, that sold 105 million copies, Super Mario Bros. with 40, or even Lemmings on the Amiga with 16 million. A few problems exist with racing games. Number 1. The main problem with racing games is that they are just as fun to watch because for the most part, a lot of racing games cater to one of two groups. Casual players who want that arcade experience or extremely hardcore racing simulation fans who want that photorealistic experience. There's very little mingling in the middle ground because its territory is very dangerous to developers looking to profit off their games, thus leading to stagnation and lack of gameplay variety. Number two, a lack of diversity in gameplay mechanics may make the game genre overall feel quite stale. You drive a car. That's pretty much it for the core experience in racing games. Sure, the tracks and the terrain are switched up, especially with different weather effects and environments, but at the end of the day, you're driving a car the same way you drove cars 20 years ago. Other genres, more popular and growing genres, have seen evolution, iteration with new games, improvement in systems and new mechanics to keep things fresh. Racing games have not. The language and semantics of racing games have not evolved very much. Number three, the most preferred way to play racing games requires purchase of a racing wheel. Playing a racing game on a pad for a racing game pro is like eating a nice dinner on a paper plate. Because racing games strive for the most realistic experience possible, one needs that racing wheel in order to get the best gameplay experience, and a decent wheel on the PC can run you hundreds of dollars, which is a giant barrier in the face of gamers who want to tap into that genre. Number four, gamers have stopped caring. A lot of gamers don't give a crap about racing games because they don't give them a chance due to how homogenized their vision is of the genre. Prior to this video, I was one of those people, I will be honest. However, I will say that playing Dirt Rally after not touching a racing game for 10 years was absolutely invigorating. For 100. 80. Right, four narrows. Racing games, technologically speaking, have come a long way. The sense of realism you can get from tearing into a track with the engine roaring in the background as you barely skate around corners, mud flying on the windshield, and sun rays obstructing your views as you turn down the valley road can be very powerful. I was quite mesmerized while I was capturing this footage. The racing scene needs to grab the attention of gamers, invent new gameplay experiences, like it did with original and innovative titles such as F-Zero in the past. <laughs> Moving on to strategy games. Strategy games are like the old dog in the house. Successful games were littering the market 10 to 15 years ago with StarCraft, the Command and Conquer series, Civilization, Warcraft, you name it. We had some absolutely colossal games. Strategy games, however, were born and bred on the PC. Playing a strategy game on a console is not an option. It's worse than going to county jail for the night. The main problem for strategy games, according to me, is that like racing games, they are very niche and have often enormous learning curves and high skill floors. A high skill floor raises the cost of entry for the player and demands that they forgive time, energy, and effort to learn the mechanics of games, invest huge chunks of time, and consistently play in order to maintain their skill at the game. If someone plays a strategy game regularly and then stops for a few months, they're going to have a few days of dexterity and mental relearning going on in order for them to return to their prior state of gameplay. With the advent and popularity of mobile, quick and accessible gaming, strategy games stand awkwardly at the far end of the room. Your weird uncle that wants to talk your ear off at Thanksgiving while all you want to do is dive into those mashed potatoes. Sometimes, tutorials and strategy games can be mind-numbingly long and deafen a player's energy level before they even get through it. 
Strategy games are also incredibly mentally taxing. They are draining, and the reason why the average pro player life cycle is very low. Marathoning all night with strategy games like StarCraft or Civ V saps you of your life force. Whereas take that same amount of time and put it into Minecraft and you'll notice the difference right away. Strategy games exchange your time for reward. You get what you put in. And not a whole lot of players want such an exchange system when easier, more approachable games exist in droves. Lastly, strategy games have one of the worst losing conditions in a genre. In a game of StarCraft 2, you could put 30 to 40 minutes into a grueling game between a decent opponent. The battles could rage back and forth, your fingers and your brain going wild in an effort to try to outsmart your opponent, but someone has to lose. Staring at a you lost or you've been defeated screen after 30 to 60 minutes of gameplay feels absolutely awful. Compare that to an arena shooter like Overwatch. You get that screen maybe after 5 to 10 minutes, but then you're immediately back in the fight 2 minutes later. It's definitely not as painful. Now let's take a look at adventure games. For people who grew up with the Nintendo 64, this genre sits very close to our hearts. It's a shame then that we have basically seen it die out entirely in the last 10 years. I can name you 10 to 15 great action games that have been released in the last 5 years. I cannot name you even 5 great adventure platform games that have been released in double that span of time. The market has shifted and corporations have decided that we don't want this genre anymore. The main reason for this is that adventure platform games don't have a multiplayer. Developers want multiplayer components to their games to A. Increase the lifespan of their game B. Grow a community around the game and C. Increase the opportunity for making extra money by way of microtransactions, season passes, and DLC content. Banjo-Kazooie and Mario were self-contained, wonderful games that gave us memorable gameplay experiences. But chances are, we only played through them once or twice, maybe three times, before we turned to the next game. Developers caught on to this and realized it would be better to steer away from this genre as it was a waste of money and development time. The reason for this is that developers don't like taking risks. A single player game, adventure game, in this day and age is considered a very big risk with a low potential payoff. I truly hope though that a lot of these genres have the opportunity to make a comeback in the near future because they all have fantastic games in their own right but maybe need a little bit more innovation and iteration before more people start to steer towards them. <laughs> Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, hit the thumbs up button and subscribe. We'll send you a notification when we put out our next video. And wherever you are in the world, I hope you have an awesome rest of your day. And we'll see you next time.